Hello and welcome to the history webinar for early Elizabethan England. Today we're going to try and cover all of the course content for this part of your GCSE. Before we start, please make sure that you have some way of making notes ready to hand as we go through the session, either pen or paper or electronic device, so you can jot down some ideas. Periodically throughout the session, I'm going to be asking you to pause the video to try and either recall some information or in a couple of cases, analyze information that's been presented to you. So if you don't have a notepad or a device near you, I suggest you pause this video now, find something to make notes with, and then replay the video when you're ready to go. Okay, the course Elizabeth in England starts in 1558 with Elizabeth I becoming queen of England, aged just 25 years old. Now, to understand the course, we really need to understand the problems that Elizabeth faces as queen when she comes to the throne. Possibly the first and biggest problem she faces is that of religious conflict. Now, straight away, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and see if you can remember and jot down reasons why religion and religious conflict was a problem for Elizabeth when she came to the throne in 1558. When you think you've got some ideas down and want to see how you did, unpause the video and I will go through why that was a problem. Okay, so religious conflict was a major, major issue for Elizabethan England. We have to remember that when Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558, Europe is at the height of what is known as a Reformation. This is this period of huge cataclysmic change when Christianity is embroiled in a conflict between the Catholic Church, the old form of Christianity, and this new Protestant form of Christianity. We remember that Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, had broken from Rome, which means he'd rejected the authority of the Catholic Pope, and he created an independent Church of England. However, this was not a Protestant church yet, and Henry VIII was not clear at all whether he wanted this Church of England to be Protestant or Catholic. Over the next 25 years, this new Church of England shifted. Sometimes, under the reign of Edward VI, for example, Henry's son, becoming very, very Protestant, and then, under the reign of Mary I, reversing and going back to being very strictly Catholic. And this back and forth between Protestantism and Catholicism led to a lot of confusion, a lot of conflict and a lot of chaos in England. This is perhaps most notably seen when 300 Protestants had been burnt at the stake by Queen Mary I before Elizabeth came to the throne. This is an example of the conflict and violence we were seeing, but we must be careful. We must also realise that Edward, in his reign, had killed some Catholics as well. So it wasn't just Catholics killing Protestants. But either way, 25 years before Elizabeth comes to the throne and there's been this violence and conflict and turmoil. Now, whilst Elizabeth herself was raised Protestant, she was then very much a symbol of this Protestant Reformation because it was to marry Elizabeth's mother Anne Boleyn that Henry had split from the church in the first place. Elizabeth's very Protestant, but she wants to create a via media. She wants to create what's known as a middle way, and she wants to end the conflict. She wants to create a situation which will be pleasing to both sides. This is going to be extremely challenging, mainly because the country is split down the middle. Half the country is Catholic, mainly the north and the west, the areas further away from London, where these ideas of Protestantism haven't quite spread yet. Whereas closer to the centre of power, London and the South East, they were more likely to be Protestant. If Elizabeth gets her settlement wrong, her religious settlement wrong, she's in danger of rebellion. Henry, Edward and Mary had all faced rebellions based on religion during their reigns. To make matters even more complicated, the most powerful countries in Europe were Catholic. And if Elizabeth persecutes Catholics or goes very strongly Protestant, she may face repercussions from these European countries. 
And finally, some of the most influential people in England, around a third of the nobility, perhaps, we're not quite sure, estimates of about a third of the nobility, and all of the bishops of the Church of England were Catholics. Now, this, these groups, the nobility and the bishops, both had influence in Parliament, and they would be able to stop or try and block changes Elizabeth might want to make. So religion is a problem for Elizabeth because we've got this division, this conflict prior to her coming to the throne, and we have this desire of hers to create a middle way, but we can see why this is not going to be an easy thing to do straight away. So that's our first problem. Elizabeth's second is foreign relations, and again, I'm going to pause the video, I'll ask you to pause the video, and recommend that you take a few minutes, try and jot down as much as you can remember about the foreign challenges facing Elizabeth, in particular, the nature of France, Spain and Scotland in this period. Okay, let's see what we got. Now the most powerful country in Europe at this time is Spain. Its ruler was King Philip II, who was actually Elizabeth's former brother-in-law. He had been the husband of Queen Mary I. It was a fiercely Catholic country, but it was also a very wealthy country. And this comes from its conquest of the New World, what we would call America, South America and Central America, and the Caribbean in particular today. Every summer, huge quantities of gold and silver are being transported from the New World back to Spain, making Spain and Philip extremely, extremely wealthy. Spain also controlled a large European empire. In, most notably was the Netherlands, which I'm going to circle here, which were controlled by Spain. Now, these Netherlands were actually predominantly Protestant, and a rebellion from the Protestant Dutch against Spanish is going to be a major event in the reign of Elizabeth. But we must remember that Spain is the wealthiest and most powerful country at this time. The second most powerful country in the world at this time was France. Now, France was England's traditional and biggest enemy. And in fact, when Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558, England and France are currently at war. She inherits a war from Mary Tudor. Like Spain, France was a strongly Catholic country. However, it did have a growing number of Protestants within it, quite a strong Protestant movement known as the Huguenots. Conflict between the Catholics and Protestants in France is going to impact on Elizabeth's reign later on. Now, Scotland is an independent country. The ruler is Mary Queen of Scots. We're going to come on later to why Mary Queen of Scots was a problem in herself. Scotland and France are allies, and their alliance is known as the Old Alliance. Mary, the Queen of Scotland, she is actually in France at the start of our story, married to the heir to the French throne. Now, whilst Mary herself is a strong Catholic, in 1559, so one year after Elizabeth becomes Queen, Scotland becomes a Protestant country with the aid of Elizabeth. But we can see the predicament Elizabeth's in, because she is surrounded by three very powerful Catholic countries, Spain, France and Scotland. Luckily for Elizabeth, Spain and France do not get on. There's a lot of tension between the royal houses of Spain and France, which prevents them from joining an alliance, forming an alliance against England. The last power in Europe is the papacy. This is the Pope, who is based in Rome, in what we would today call Italy, although that did not yet exist as a country. The Pope was the head of the Catholic Church, and as such, he had large influence amongst Catholics, including the kings of Spain and France and Mary Queen of Scots. His ultimate sanction he could issue was that of excommunication, which was to banish someone from the Catholic Church and to authorise their deposition. And as I already mentioned at the bottom, luckily for Elizabeth, tensions between these Catholic powers meant, at least at the start of her reign, there seemed to be little chance of the Catholic powers uniting against her. But she still should be concerned about these Catholic 
foreign threats. Okay, before we look at how Elizabeth starts to solve these problems, we are going to have a look at her last four problems she faces. And I've given you four headings on the board, legitimacy, gender, marriage, and then finance and the economy. Again, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and see if you can jot down on your paper, on your device, why these four issues were problems for Elizabeth in 1558. And replay the video once you think you've got some answers. Okay, the first problem we've got here is legitimacy. Now, legitimacy is the issue of whether or not someone is the authentic, correct monarch. And Catholics believed Elizabeth was not legitimate. They believed her to be illegitimate. They believed because her parents, Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, their marriage had never been authorised by the Pope, who, according to Catholics, is the only person who can authorise a divorce and a new marriage that she was therefore a bastard child and was not able to become monarch. This is a problem for Elizabeth because not only do they believe that Elizabeth is illegitimate, they therefore believe that someone else is the real monarch of England. And in Elizabeth's case, they believe that Mary, Queen of Scots, who was Elizabeth's cousin, was the true Queen of England as well. This is going to cause problems throughout her reign but immediately that started her reign is also a problem because remember around a half of her country is Catholic, especially in the north and west, which is away from her power base. So potentially half the country believe she shouldn't be queen in the first place. Second problem we've got on the board is gender. Now gender was a problem for Elizabeth due to the patriarchal and sexist views of the 16th century. Men in the Tudor period had held views which stated that women could not hold power, they could not control men in government, they could not lead an army into battle, all these things which were expected from a monarch at the time. Elizabeth was only the second crowned Queen of England. The only other Queen of England crowned was Mary I, who had gained the nickname of Bloody Mary and was seen as having very unstable rule. So at the beginning of her reign, people saw Elizabeth as weak, purely because of her gender. This is a problem and a perception of herself that she's going to have to try to overcome. Linked to this issue of gender is the issue of marriage, because Elizabeth was the last of the Tudors. It was expected, therefore, that she would marry and have an heir, preferably a son at this time, because without this, the Tudor line would end and her dynasty would be over. But this caused some problems, because in a Tudor marriage in the 16th century, the wife was expected to do what was instructed by the husband. Now this couldn't tally with Elizabeth as monarch being appointed by God and being the single most important person in the country. How could she be a good monarch and be the most important person, yet also a good Tudor wife and follow the instructions of the husband? That meant marriage was very, very difficult and potentially something Elizabeth would be very reluctant to get involved with. Even if Elizabeth did want to marry, the choice of who to marry was very problematic as well. If Elizabeth married a foreign prince, this could lead to foreign interference and England being dragged into European affairs. As I mentioned earlier, Mary I, Elizabeth's sister, had been married to Philip of Spain, and there was a lot of xenophobia and hatred of Spaniards in England during Mary's reign, and England got dragged into Spain's wars with France. The other option would be to marry an Englishman. But whoever she choose, all the other most prominent noble Englishmen would resent this choice massively and would resent the growth of power for her husband, and this could lead to division. So even if she did marry, it was going to cause tensions, and if she didn't marry, it was going to cause problems for the Tudor dynasty. Finally, we need to talk about finance and the economy. Due to the wars, France, Mary I has left Elizabeth with a very substantial debt of £227,000. Elizabeth is forced to sell off lots of her land to try and f repay this debt, which means the crown, the institution of the monarchy, struggles to get income later on in her reign. 
and she also inherits high levels of unemployment, poverty, and a series of poor harvests, which we're going to look at later on, which causes great social and economic problems. But these are the main problems Elizabeth was facing. The biggest two are the foreign challenges and the religion, and then we have the issues of legitimacy, gender, marriage, and finance. We're going to see how she tried to solve that first problem of religion. And just before we do, a quick reminder of the differences between Catholics and Protestants, which we've got on the screen here. So, Pope is the head of a church called Catholics, whereas Protestants believe monarch is the head of a church. They also differ on the languages for Bibles and services. Catholics view it should be Latin, Protestants, English. For decorations of churches, Catholics believe the church should be highly decorated to honour the glory God, whereas Protestants believe that decorating churches is distracting from the worship of God and they should be plain and simple. Catholics believe that priests are the only people who can communicate with God and therefore they should wear vestments, they must not marry, they must not have children. Protestants do not believe that priests are holy, they simply stay to a clergy, as they call them, just lead the service. But anyone can communicate with God, the clergy shouldn't be wearing vestments, they don't need to avoid marrying. And the last one at the bottom there, which is the most sort of subtle difference, Catholics believe at the time of transubstantiation during Holy Communion. This is during the service involving the bread and wine. Catholics believed that this literally became the body and blood of Christ by a miracle when someone took Holy Communion, whereas a Protestant believes taking the bread and wine is not miraculously turning into the body and blood of Christ. It is instead just symbolic of the Last Supper. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Elizabeth is trying to create via media. So the first year after she becomes queen, in 1559, she makes her religious settlement through Parliament. And it came in three parts. The first part was the Act of Supremacy. And this is where Elizabeth became the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. The Pope's authority was rejected and everyone had to swear an oath of loyalty to her. The next part was the Act of Uniformity. This meant everything had to be uniform in the Church of England, and in particular, the English Book of Common Prayer. So, prayer book and Bible in English had to be used, although wording around the Holy Communion was deliberately left vague. This act also was what stated if you didn't attend the Church of England service every Sunday, you would be a recusant and you would be fined one shilling. Now, one shilling at the time was not much for a nobleman, but for an ordinary person, that was about your average week's wage. So you couldn't afford to be fined for every single week. And finally, the last part was the royal injunctions. So Catholic doctrines, Catholic beliefs about pilgrimages and saints were to be denounced, were to be um, said was not true. Images in churches, decoration and vestments, which were the special robes of priests, were to be allowed. The royal supremacy, which means the fact that the monarch is in charge of the church, was to be preached and taught, and all churches must use an English Bible. Now, I'm going to ask you to pause the video, and I'm going to ask you to jot down areas of the religious settlement which would be pleasing to Protestants, and areas that would be pleasing to Catholics, and perhaps a few areas which would not please either. Okay, let's see how you did. On the board, you will see the difference. So I've got Catholic ideas in red and Protestant ideas in blue. So Elizabeth being head of the church is a Protestant idea. English prayer books, Protestant idea. However, you will notice there are a couple of Catholic elements designed to keep the Catholic population at least satisfied. Especially with the communion, it's vaguely worded so that both Catholics and Protestants can believe whatever they like. And now I've said this is going to be pleasing to Catholics because this is perhaps better than they would have expected. Protestants would have expected to have it to be just symbolic. The fact it's been left vague is what Catholics would have hoped for. The part about recusants, I've left um, for neither because actually neither would have found this about pleasing because some Protestants wanted their own type of church and these were Puritans and we'll come on to those in a second. But we fundamentally need to understand that most of the Church of England under Elizabeth is mostly Protestant with some Catholic elements to try and to create a compromise in the via media. However, that does not stop 
some radical and extreme Protestants known as Puritans trying to change the settlement. So we come on to the Puritan challenge. Now, in some ways, the Puritan challenge is quite strong, and in some ways, it's quite weak. On the board, on the screen, I've put four factors of the Puritan challenge. Friends in high places, the crucifix controversy, the vestment controversy, and then their limited numbers and options. Again, please pause the video and try and work out, are these elements of the Puritan challenge which would be make them strong or weak? Try and remember what these refer to. Okay, friends in high places is an element of the Puritan challenge which makes them strong. Several of Elizabeth's privy councillors, including her closest friend, according to many, Dudley, and her spymaster, Walsingham, are Puritans. They have the ear of the Queen. There's also quite a prominent group of Puritan MPs. However, their influence is often limited, and whenever they try and change Puritan, or introduce Puritan changes into Parliament, they often end up imprisoned. The crucifix controversy is also an example of the Puritans being a strong challenge to the settlement, because this is an example of them forcing Elizabeth to back down. Crucifix was a statue of Christ being crucified in church, and it was part of a decoration of churches which extreme Protestants like the Puritans hated. Puritan bishops refused, uh, sorry, threatened to resign in protest over use of these crucifixes, and because Elizabeth didn't have enough bishops to replace them, she's forced to back down and agree that crucifixes would be removed from all churches except her own private chapel. However, a few years later, the Puritans tried to make Elizabeth back down again, this time over the issue of vestments, which were those decorative, special holy robes that the clergy were expected to wear. Remember, Protestants believe that clergy aren't special, they shouldn't be wearing these holy special robes. So Puritans refused to wear the vestments, but Elizabeth, Archbishop of Canterbury, said, you can wear plain vestments, but you must be wearing vestments. And even when 37 Puritans resigned, Elizabeth refused to back down. This is later in her reign in the 1560s. She feels stronger and more secure. And this is an example of the Puritans not being able to get their way. Finally, perhaps most importantly, the reason why the Puritan challenge was never that strong, at least in my opinion, was because they are very divided. There's several different groups of Puritans. There's no real leader. There's only a few hundred of them, really. It's mainly in London amongst the gentry and upper classes. And unlike the Catholics who had Mary Queen of Scots as an alternative monarch, they can't get rid of Elizabeth because if they get rid of Elizabeth, the next Queen of England would be Mary, a Catholic, who would be even worse to these Puritans. So their protest can only ever go so far. So that's the Puritan challenge. You need to understand why it's strong and why it is weak. Again, we now come to the Catholic challenge. Pause the video and see if you can tell me how the papacy, English nobility, plots, Spain and France and Elizabeth's tolerance contributed to a Catholic threat or a lack of Catholic threat. Now, the papacy is an example of the Catholic threat in theory being strong. We talked about earlier the Pope being able to excommunicate Elizabeth as a high punishment. And in fact, the Pope does do this in 1570. Now, in theory, this is a very strong threat for Elizabeth because it gives every Catholic in England the right to try and overthrow her and permission not to follow her orders. However, this comes 12 years into Elizabeth's reign. It's very late on, and by this point, many Catholics have learned to accept the settlement, and in many ways, it's not really followed, this excommunication, and has little impact in England. It also becomes treasonous to share a copy of this excommunication, so very few people in England actually see it. The English nobility. Again, in theory, a problem. Around a third of the English nobility were recusants, which means we can infer that they were Catholic. We'll come on to a bit more later, but two English nobles, the Earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland, lead a Catholic rebellion in 1569 in favour of American Scots. However, no other nobles joined them and they were easily crushed. And in response, recusancy fines were increased to £20 to try and deter nobles. That's a much harsher sum that even nobles would struggle to pay. 
plots, we get a series of plots in the 1570s and 80s, the Frockmorton, Babington and Rodolfi plots. Potentially dangerous because they involve the Pope and Spain and France. But again, in reality, they're not that dangerous. They're all discovered quite early by Elizabeth's spies and eventually Mary, Queen of Scots herself, is executed because of these plots. Spain and France. We've talked about Spain and France being the most powerful countries and powerful Catholic countries in the world. Potentially, they could make Elizabeth's time very difficult. However, they don't. Neither send any aid to English Catholics in the first 30 years of Elizabeth's reign. They are both occupied with internal religious conflicts. France actually is in a religious civil war at this time. We've got the French Protestants, which I mentioned briefly earlier, against the French monarchy, having a war of religion. And the Spanish are dealing with the Netherlands, who are rebelling against Spanish rule. So they're both too busy to help the English Catholics. And then finally, the fact that Elizabeth is so tolerant, the fact that she doesn't try to punish Catholics, the fact that she just she gives them a fine, but doesn't want to create martyrs, doesn't do any burnings. She promises famously that I will not open windows unto men's souls. This means that you can believe what you like in your heart. You can be a Catholic. I don't care. As long as you turn up to church every Sunday as well, that's fine by me. And for many Catholics, this is better than they had feared. Under Mary's reign, Protestants have been burnt. Many of them would understandably fear that when Elizabeth came to the throne, Catholics were going to be persecuted in a similar way. The fact that they're not means there's no need to rebel. They're not going to risk their life in a rebellion when actually their, their tolerance is quite high. So that's the very settlement. We're now going to move on to the second part of the course, which is threats at home and abroad. And the centre of a lot of the early threats, especially the threat to home, is Mary Queen of Scots. We need to understand a bit about Mary Queen of Scots' life to really understand why she's a threat. Firstly, Mary has always been a threat to Elizabeth because she is Elizabeth's heir. She has a claim to the throne of England. She was a cousin of Elizabeth, and if Elizabeth was to die without children, Mary would become queen. This is very worrying for Elizabeth because Mary is a Catholic, she would reverse Elizabeth's religious settlement. Even worse for Elizabeth is the fact we talked about earlier that Catholics in Europe and in England as well argue that Mary wasn't just the heir to England, but the true queen. So in many people's eyes, Mary Queen of Scots was also Mary Queen of England. And at the start of Elizabeth's reign, Mary was in France and she symbolised the powerful and threatening Catholic old alliance between Scotland and France. She was not only the Queen of Scotland, but because she was married to the King of France, she was also Queen of France. And these are two very powerful countries surrounding England. And in Mary, Elizabeth felt very vulnerable. Now, fortunately for Elizabeth, Mary's power starts to decline in the 1560s. Mary's husband, the King of France, Francis II, dies in a freak, as uh, in an illness. Mary has to return to Scotland. Now, in some ways, you'd expect that to be a positive time for Mary. She's going back to her homeland. However, in her absence, Scotland has become a Protestant country, dominated by Protestant lords. She is forced to accept that Scotland was Protestant, and she is very unpopular there as a Catholic queen. And in fact, she's forced to abdicate. She's forced to give up the throne of Scotland in 1567 by the Scottish Protestant lords, partly because of her religion, but also because of the scandalous murder of her second husband, which many people believe that Mary herself was involved with. Now, even though Mary's power is decreasing in this period, actually, when she's at her most vulnerable is when she becomes most dangerous for Elizabeth, because in 1568, Mary, who had been imprisoned by the Scottish lords, she escapes from her island prison and she flees to England asking Elizabeth for help. She expects Elizabeth to help as her cousin, as her fellow monarch. Elizabeth instead imprisons Mary because she can't execute Mary straight away because she doesn't want to execute another monarch. She believes monarchs are appointed by God. But equally, she doesn't want to help Mary because she doesn't want Scotland to become Catholic again. And she can't let Mary stay free because remember, English Catholics who are many in the north, where Mary's arrived in, believe that Mary should be Queen of England. So she's dangerous. And so from this point on, even though she's in prison, Mary becomes what I would call a lightning rod for Catholics in England. And plots and revolts start to develop around Mary. The 
The first of his plots is the revolt of northern earls, which happens the year after Mary arrives, not coincidentally in 1569. We've mentioned this earlier already. This is when the earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland, who were both Catholics, aimed to depose Elizabeth, replace her with Mary, who had been married to the Duke of Norfolk, and England would be returned to Catholicism. We'll quickly go over the causes. One of the main causes of his religion, they resisted the Protestant religious settlement, they wanted um, Catholicism to return to England. However, there's also politics at play here. The Earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland were the elders that belonged to the Neville and Percy families. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Neville and Percy families have been very important north of England and basically ruled the north of England um, on behalf of the monarch. However, because they were Catholic, they had lost their power under Elizabeth and been replaced by Protestants. So these families, the Earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland, wanted to rebel to try and get their power back. And also in 1569, of course, they sniff an opportunity because Mary has arrived, which gives the Earls a figure to rally around. They have someone with whom they can replace Elizabeth with. Unfortunately for the Earls, they don't succeed. First thing they do is they march to Durham in the north and they hold a Catholic mass in the cathedral, which shows how important religion was to them. They then appeal to all the other Catholic nobles in England and foreign countries to help them. No other English nobles come to help, which shows either a support for Elizabeth or fear of failure. The earls had also expected Spanish troops to arrive at Hartlepool, but that doesn't appear either. So actually they turn out to be very few in number. Elizabeth moves Mary south out of the grasp of the rebels and the royal army marches north, west from all of and flee and they are both executed. Consequence, 700 of the rebels are executed. Although Elizabeth does not execute Mary and Scots because she does not want to execute another monarch. And also there's no evidence at this point that Mary knew anything about the rebellion. It's after this, in fact, that the Pope excommunicates Elizabeth as a response to these executions. However, as I said, that excommunication has very limited impact because it's treasonous to share a copy of it. That's the biggest rebellion Elizabeth faces in her reign. After that, we don't get rebellions for Elizabeth, but we get a secret plot to try and murder her. The first is the Rodolphe plot of 1571. All three of these fail, so what's more important for us to know about is the consequences of each plot. The Rodolphi leads to the execution of the Duke of Norfolk, who was the most powerful nobleman in all of England. He was involved in the plot and he would converted to Catholicism. This shows how serious Elizabeth thought this plot was if she's executing the most powerful noble in England because of it. However, again, Elizabeth refuses to execute Mary, even though her Privy Council very much pressuring her to do so. She does not want to do so. She believes monarchs have been appointed by God and she believes she'll be setting a dangerous precedent if she does execute a fellow monarch. However, after this plot, we see even more action taken against Catholics. If you are a Catholic priest in England, it, that just becomes treason. The punishment for treason at the time being, being hung, drawn and quartered, very unpleasant punishment. After the next plot, the Frock Plot in 1583, Elizabeth again refused to execute Mary, and this is driving the Privy Council, in particular William Cecil and Sir Francis Walsingham, furious. They hate Mary. They believe her to be a real threat to their Queen Elizabeth, and they really see her as a threat to Protestantism. So they agree secretly something called the Bond of Association, which says that if there's any further plot, or if Elizabeth is killed, they will agree to do whatever they can in their power to ensure that Mary dies as a result. So that Mary will not benefit from any further plot against Elizabeth. This then leads us into our final plot, the Babington plot. Darth Walsingham, who is Elizabeth's spymaster, he discovers the plot early, but he lets it unravel until he finds evidence that proves that Mary knows about it and Mary is involved, which he does do. When he gets this evidence, he draws a little noose, a hangman's noose on the side of the evidence to sort of say, I've got you, you're dead. Parliament put Mary in trial, find her guilty, and Elizabeth has no choice. 1587, Mary, Queen of Scots, is executed. Now, this is really the end of the threats to Elizabeth in England at home. 
but it's just the start of the threats from abroad. Because in 1585, we see the beginning of the war with Spain. And the war with Spain dominates the rest of Elizabeth's reign. It's the most important issue she faces. Remember, Spain is the most powerful country in the world. It's a very challenging war for Elizabeth to face. And there are four main causes of the war with Spain. Religious tensions, political rivalry, commercial rivalry, and the Dutch revolt. Again, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and see what you can remember about these four causes on your paper or device. Okay, let's quickly go through these four causes, see what you could remember. Perhaps the most obvious cause is the religious tensions. As we know, Spain was a devoutly Catholic country. England, since Elizabeth's become queen, is a Protestant country. The Pope has excommunicated Elizabeth in 1570, which gave Catholic countries permission and encouragement, and almost an order, in fact, to try and replace Elizabeth. We also have this Treaty of Joinville in 1584, between Spain and French Catholics who agreed that they were going to try and remove Protestantism from the face of Europe. Previously, Spain had not wanted to invade England because they feared that England and France would unite against Spain. But now Spain and France are united in their desire to get rid of Protestantism. However, I would argue religion is not the main cause. If it was, Spain would have started the war far earlier than they do. Remember 1585, we're almost 30 years after Elizabeth's become queen, 30 years of England being Protestant. Other causes have been building to provoke this war. Part of it is political rivalry. As I said, Spain was the most powerful country in the world, but English power was growing. England was starting to develop lucrative trade routes around the world, in Russia, in West Africa, in North America, even around the Cape of Good Hope to India. This beginnings of international power and prestige for England was a threat to Spain's power. The easiest way for Spain to maintain their power was to try and crush England. More excitingly perhaps is the commercial rivalry. This is the actions of people like Sir Francis Drake, the privateers who were sponsored by Elizabeth, who targeted um, Spanish treasure ships, those huge fleets of ships coming back from the new world of gold and silver every year for their own profit. Drake is the most famous of these. He becomes known as the Dragon or El Draco in Spain because of his ferocity. In one journey, his circumnavigation of the world, he steals £400,000 of Spanish silver. This is millions and millions and millions of pounds today. And most provocatively for the Spanish, in 1580, when he returns from this journey, Elizabeth knights him on the deck of his ship, the Golden Hind, showing she publicly approves of his actions. However, the most important cause, I would argue, and the trigger cause, really, is the Dutch Revolt. Now, the Dutch refers to the Spanish Netherlands, as you see on your map there. Remember, the Spanish Netherlands were controlled by Spain, but they were a Protestant part of Spain's empire, ruled by the Catholics in Spain. Now, the Dutch people in the Netherlands rebelled against the um, Spanish, partly because they wanted their own independence and partly because they wanted to be a Protestant independent country. Elizabeth interferes and she supports the Dutch rebels with money and arms. She wants to keep the Dutch rebellion going as long as possible, partly because she wants to have a Protestant country in Europe, but mainly because she wants to distract Spain. The longer the Spanish Netherlands are in rebellion, the longer Elizabeth has to strengthen and Spain will not have the resources to focus on England. So this builds tension because Philip and Spain, they suspect that Elizabeth is helping the Dutch, they can't really prove it, but this is building tension. However, in 1584, Elizabeth's hand is forced. She can't just secretly support them anymore because the leader of the Dutch revolt, a man called William of Orange, sometimes known as William the Silent, was assassinated by the Spanish. And suddenly this Dutch rebellion, which has been going for almost 20 years, looks like it's going to fail and they are going to surrender. Elizabeth can't have this, and so she intervenes. She signs the Treaty of Nonsuch, where she promises to lead the Dutch and send an army and money to support them. And this treaty, the Treaty of Nonsuch, is really the declaration of war, because England is saying, we will fight the Spanish to keep the Netherlands independent. So these are the four main causes of the war. 
Now, we don't need to know a huge amount about the war, but we do need to know about the most famous incident of the war, is the Spanish Armada of 1588. Before we talk about what happened to the Armada, we'll quickly consider Philip's plan. This was a plan of invasion, a very ambitious plan. Philip II planned that the Duke of Medina Sidonia would sail 130 ships with 27,000 men from Spain to the Spanish Netherlands. Obviously, Spain has a large army in the Spanish Netherlands dealing with the revolt there. In the Spanish Netherlands was their famous general, the Duke of Parma, with 30,000 men. The Armada would pick up the army in the Spanish Netherlands, cross the Channel to England, invade, conquer England, and hopefully kill Elizabeth. This is the plan. I want you to pause the video, use the map on the board, and see if you can remember what really happened and where it goes wrong. Okay, we'll start, in fact, a year before the Armada. Down here in Cadiz, where the Armada is being constructed in 1587, Sir Francis Drake leads a daring raid and destroys much of the Armada, which gives England a year to prepare whilst Philip rebuilds it. This is crucial in allowing England to build defences, warning beacons and ships, because England only really had 20 or 25 ships before Drake delayed the Armada. When the Armada is ready to sail in 1588, it is spotted off the coast of Plymouth on the 19th of July. So here. Because of the preparation Drake has brought Elizabeth, fire beacons have been set up all along the south coast of England. And so within one hour, Elizabeth knows that the Armada has arrived. This allows her to act through effective communication. The English Navy, led by Drake and Howard, chase the Armada up the channel. Now, the Spanish Armada is large, but each ship is large and cumbersome and slow, because their main purpose is to transport a large amount of soldiers. The English ships do not need to transport large amounts of soldiers, and they are actually very fast and very manoeuvrable ships. And they can fire cannons further and faster. So they can inflict quite a lot of damage as they chase the Spanish up the channel. On the 27th of July, the Armada anchor at Calais to wait for Parma and, for Duke, uh, Parma and the Spanish army to come from the Netherlands. However, Parma is a week away. He is not there ready for the Armada. The night of the 27th, Drake has a very intelligent idea. He gets some ships which have not got anyone on it sees the wind is blowing towards Calais, he sets these ships on fire. These fire ships blow towards the Spanish Armada anchored at Calais. Now, Medina Sidonia, who is not a naval man, not an experienced commander, panics, and the Spanish scatter, and they abandon Calais and they abandon their formation, leaving Parma stranded in the Netherlands. The next day, at the Battle of Gravelines, the English Navy fight the Armada, who were disorganised and in a still in a state of panic from the fire ships. The English win with their faster, more believable ships. Now, even though they've won, Spain still has more than enough ships and more than enough men to invade. However, the wind blows the remaining Armada north around the coast of Scotland and Ireland. Here they encounter heavy storms and more than half of the fleet is shipwrecked. Only 60 of the 130 ships and 10,000 of the 27,000 men Turned to Spain and the Armada is defeated. We have four main reasons for the English victory. I want to look back at that story we just heard and I want to try and find evidence for each of these four leading to the English victory. Weaknesses in the Spanish plan, English tactics, resources, wind and weather. Pause the video and restart it when you think you've got some for each. Okay, weaknesses in the Spanish plan. Firstly, Medina Sidonia 
was an inexperienced naval commander. He only got his position because he was a lord, not because he was a skilled um, captain. We see this at Calais when he panics and the Spanish um, ships scatter. Also, a failure to communicate effectively meant that Parma and his army was not in Calais on time, ready to embark. English tactics also played a role. Firstly, Drake's raid on Cadiz in 1587, what was called a singeing of the King of Spain's beard, gave England time to prepare a whole year to get ready. The warning beacons allowed rapid communication, and the use of the fire ships at Calais was ingenious and scattered the Spanish and prevented Parma from boarding. Resources also played a big part here. The English ships, the galleons in particular, were faster and more manoeuvrable than the lumpy, cumbersome Spanish transport ships. Although only 24 of all the English ships were these faster types of ships, these galleons, so maybe the impact wasn't that important. Also, during his raid, Drake had destroyed much of the Spanish supplies, which have impact later on. Also, we cannot ignore the wind and the weather. These winds and the storms which blew the Spanish around Scotland Island was really what destroyed a lot of the Armada. Now, the consequences of the, of the victory of Spanish Armada are quite significant. Firstly, England is safe from invasion. England has defeated the greatest and wealthiest country in the world. This brings a lot of prestige and power. And in fact, it's really mainly a propaganda victory for England. Elizabeth, in particular, comes out of this extremely well. You'll remember one of the main concerns about a woman ruling the country was the inability to lead troops in battle. Elizabeth proves them wrong. Despite being 55, Elizabeth is at the front of her army, ready for the armada to land if her navy fails. And she gives a very famous speech in full armour, on horseback, with her sword held aloft, saying that she will die amongst them and she, is a, she has the heart and stomach of a king of England, and that she will fight and die with them. After the victory, a special medal was issued, a thanksgiving service, which said, God blew and they were scattered, which suggests that the winds and the storms prove that God was on the Protestant side. God knew that the Catholics were wrong. So all these threats at home from abroad, the plots, the revolts, Mary Queen of Scots and the war of Spain and Spanish Armada, ultimately Elizabeth emerges victorious. The last part of our course is about life in Elizabethan England. We start with education and leisure. Now, this is really divided amongst class. We'll start with education. Over Elizabeth's reign, male literacy rises from 20% to 30%. So 10% more people, men, I should say, can read and write by the end of Elizabeth's reign. It's quite a large jump, but it's still a minority. The majority, 70%, still cannot read or write. And there's no change at all in female literacy. Only 10% of women can read or write at the start and end of Elizabeth's reign. Different classes get different education. For the nobility, if you're a son of the nobility, you get taught how to rule. You get sent to one of the public schools of Eton or Winchester. You are taught Latin and history and theology and philosophy. Daughters also are very highly educated in the nobility because Elizabeth was and they wanted to emulate her. The big new change we get in this period is for the sort of middle classes, what's called the gentry, the burgesses, the gentry of the smaller landowners, and the burgesses of the wealthy citizens of the towns. Grammar schools are set up, 72 new grammar schools are introduced, and this is for the sons of the more middle classes, and it allows new education opportunities for these sons. This is really the reason we see about 10% rise in literacy rates. For the girls of the middle classes, for the gentry and the burgess, there's not much education. It's mainly focused on domestic skills. And for the poor, almost none can get any education. Some, some very few talented boys would be paid for a place at grammar schools by a wealthy sponsor, but the vast majority have no access to education. In terms of leisure, again, it's split on class lines, with one exception. The rich, the nobles, the gentry, they do hunting, they do fencing, real tennis, which is a combination between indoor squash and tennis, music, and smoke tobacco. For the poor, the most popular things are violent sports like football, bear baiting, cockfighting, all these sorts of things. The one big development and the one which sort of unifies the classes is theatre. Before the Protestant Reformation, theatre wasn't really that big thing in England. 
the only real plays you had were Catholic saints plays or stories in the Bible. But with Protestantism, we get a move away from this and we get the plays of Ben Jonson and Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe. And it's extremely popular. You could pay one penny at the Globe to stand in the pit, the best view of the house, and many, many poor people of London did this. But the rich came as well and sat above. Unfortunately, it's not all fun leisure for the poor, because this is a period of increasing poverty in England. I'm going to ask you to pause the video once more and see if you can remember any reasons why poverty was increasing in England at this time. We'll go through them in a few moments. Okay, the first and I would argue most important reason why poverty increases in this period is population rise. In the Tudor period, in the 16th century, the population of England increased from about 2.5 million to 4 million. Now, this doesn't sound like a lot to us today. England's population is about 65 million today. However, a jump of almost double is a huge, huge jump in a country before the Industrial Revolution. And this led many historians of argue to what's called a Malthusian crisis or Malthusian catastrophe. And if you see the graph at the bottom, you can see what's happening. Population is increasing, not in a straight line, it's increasing exponentially. This is what's happening in England at the time. However, the amount of food the country could produce and the amount of land cannot keep up with this growth. And so we get to this moment the Malthusian catastrophe, where the population increases faster than the production of food and outstrips the production of food. This is what's happening in Elizabethan England that is very, very problematic. Because if there's not enough land to go around, rents are going to increase because there's more demand for land. The price of food is going to go up because there's not enough food to go around, so people are going to be desperate and pay more. But at the same time, average wages are going to go down because there's going to be more people looking for work, more people desperate for work, more people willing to accept lower wages. And this combination of rising prices and decreasing wages leads to an increase in poverty. We also have a process called enclosure. Now enclosure was when common land, which is what an English village would look like before enclosure. So for example, we see on this little diagram, open field which individual villagers would be allowed to farm part of to just feed themselves and their family a little strip this is turned into farming just for the gentry where it's closed off fences are put up hedges are put up and it's claimed by members of the gentry as their own where they normally farm sheep because it's more profitable this means the ordinary people are being kicked off their land which means to great poverty Thirdly, we have something called debasement. Now, this is when Henry VIII, during the 1540s, many decades previously, had debased the currency, which means precious metal inside the currency had been slowly removed to create more coins. This seemed like a good idea at the time, but what we didn't understand was this led to inflation because the value of the coin fell and therefore prices rose. And because we already know wages were falling at the same time, the increase of prices is also going to lead to poverty. Finally, it was poor harvest, and the vast majority of the country was farmers relied on good harvests to be able to eat. A series of bad harvests is going to lead to starvation and famine and disease. And the worst harvest of the whole period came in 1556, just before Elizabeth's reign began, so the effects of that are still being felt when Elizabeth becomes queen, but also throughout her reign there are periodic bad harvests, in particular in the 1590s. This leads to price rising and increased poverty as well. And it wasn't like today, where there was a lot of support for, the, for people who were suffering in poverty. And in fact, people in the Tudor period had a distinction between the types of poor. Some people were called the deserving poor, and this was people like the very old, the very young, or the physically disabled, the people who had an obvious reason to be poor, and who deserved help. And then there was also the undeserving poor, who were also called the able-bodied poor. 
who seemingly had no real reason to be poor, according to Judas, who didn't understand why people couldn't find jobs when the population was rising, and so deserved to be punished for being lazy. Even worse, according to Lynn Elizabethan, was vagrants or vagabonds. These were poor people with no land who wandered from town to town in search of work. Elizabethans believed that they were criminals who spread disease and fear. Now, but the only real help you could get at this time was a poor rate, which is the church was expected to organise in the local area. The rich were expected to charitably donate some money to help the deserving poor. This wasn't compulsory, but it was voluntary. We see punishment of the poor in the 1572 Vagabond Act. Anyone caught being a vagrant was whipped through the streets and mutilated. They had a hole drilled through their ear. If you did it again, you were sent to what's called a house correction, which is an early form of prison, almost like a workhouse from the Victorian era. We also get something called the Act for the Relief of the Poor. We start to see a bit of a change of attitude here because towns are required to find work for the undeserving poor. So it was an attempt to try and help the undeserving poor. But more often than not, they are just sent to these prisons, the houses of correction. So this is a time of increasing poverty and a lack of real solution to try and solve it. The final element of our course we're going to look at today is exploration. Now, in this period, in the 16th century, England and Englishmen are starting to explore more rapidly and more widely. There's a number of reasons for this. Again, I want you to try and pause the video and jot down any reasons you can remember why exploration increases in this period. The main reasons are these. Firstly, improved ship design. We see an example of Sir Francis Drake's ship on the right, the Golden Hind. These English galleons that were designed in the 16th century were more stable and more capable of crossing oceans than ships of the last few centuries. This meant travel was safer, more reliable, people were more willing to do it. We also get improved navigational technologies. A new invention called the astrolabe allowed sailors to use stars to work out where on the globe they were using latitude and longitude. This was very, very useful when you're far away from land in the middle of the ocean and all you've got to help you is the stars. The Mercator map as well was one of the earliest and most accurate world maps which really allowed people to explore um, the Atlantic Ocean in particular. People are also enticed into exploration by rewards. The New World, the Americas, is filled with um, opportunities and new crops to sell like potatoes and tobacco and there's rumours of cities filled with gold of El Dorado. And so people travel across the oceans to try and get rich and to try and get famous like their heroes Drake and Walter Raleigh. Finally, very easy is expanding trade and the most notorious and awful but lucrative of these is the slave trade which is developed by John Hawkins and Sir Francis Drake in the 1560s. The opportunities to get wealthy from trade such as these dealing in human people is enticing unfortunately for many. Now in our course we need to know a bit about two voyages of exploration. The first is Francis Drake's circumnavigation of the globe. This means he travelled all the way around the globe and returned to England. This is extraordinary. He did this in over three years in 1577 to 80. It took him three years to do it I should say. And he was only the second person in history to ever achieve defeat. And really he was the first because, or the first captain at least, because the captain of the first fleet, Magellan, died halfway round. His crew finished off. Drake was the first captain to complete the feat. And before Drake, England was not seen as a particularly capable seafaring nation. The most famous sailors and explorers had always been the Portuguese or Chinese before. But now England was proven it too could be a famous and capable explorers. Drake also sets up a colony in what's today around San Francisco, he calls Nova Albion, even though it doesn't last very long, it sets precedent for future empire. 
and it also brings huge wealth for Drake and the English throne. He steals, as we mentioned before, four hundred thousand pounds, millions and millions of pounds a day of Spanish silver. The last we're going to talk about today is Raleigh's colonization of Virginia, and again, this is a failure, but it laid foundations of empire. He doesn't go himself, Raleigh. Remember, he just organizes and finances it. Virginia is in what's now the United States, and it's named Virginia in honor of Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. Both attempts fail, we need to understand why. The first attempt fails, partly bad luck. One of their main ships, the Tiger, which carried a lot of their food supplies, hit a rock as it was landing, and seawater flooded the cabin, uh, sort of a cargo hold, I should say, and destroyed much of the food. Not having enough farmers meant they couldn't deal with this setback, so they had to rely on the Native American Secretarian people for aid. Unfortunately, tensions increased between the Secretarian and the English, partly because the English unknowingly spread disease to these people, and when their chief, Wingina, was executed and attacked, the colony was abandoned. The second attempt was known as the Lost Colony of 1587. Now, the colonists arrived too late in the year in 1587 to plant seeds. So again, they had to rely on the Native American people. Now, we don't know what happened to this colony, because the support ships who was meant to help them could not come back to the colony for three years, because Elizabeth ordered all ships had to stay in England to help fight the Armada of 1588. When they did return in 1590, they found the entire colony had disappeared, with only the mysterious word Croatoan carved on a tree. People speculate to this day what that means. Right, that is the end of the early Elizabethan England course. Hopefully this has been a good summary for you and a good opportunity to recap and refresh some of the key points in the course. This video is going to be saved on to show my homework so you'll be able to access it again use it to revise throughout your GCC course. That's all from me. I wish you all very well and I look forward to seeing some of you soon. Hopefully this has been helpful.